Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. How are you? I am uh, peachy. Yeah? Yeah. How does that compare to... Uh, I'm all apples. I'm all apples. How does that compare to being to, to one who would be all apples? Uh, you know, they're, they're comparable, but uh, I think peachy might be a little better. A little sweeter? Would you yeah. say it's sweeter? And a little fuzzier. <laughs> oh. I'm feeling a little fuzzier today, therefore I'm peachy. <laughs> Um, how, how are you is the question. I don't like talking about it. 
Yeah. This is the, the longest I've ever been sick. The longest, Andy. So is it almost to the point of sour grapes? Yeah, that's right. Certainly yeah. sour apples. <laughs> I'm full of sour apples. Oh, dear. I'm just mad now. It won't go away. My kids are better. That was the worst when we were when we were a full on TB clinic at my house. Like yeah, all huh. my kids out of school. Had me, the government had the government come and like put the big plastic sheath around your house? They did. We were covered with visqueen. Mm-hmm. Old trains would pull up and just let the convalescents off in, in my driveway, and we mm-hmm. would all hang out in my backyard with our throats to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just horrible. <laughs> it was. It was pretty bad. No. <coughs> and yet it still holds on. It does. It's still evil. here. Yeah. Oh, it's horrible. I got my lozenges, though. I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, well, you need those. I need those. Need to head back to the store, though. I'm out of my recharge. Recharge is a, is a pretty incredible thing for sick people. Is it? Yeah. You ever had the recharge? Orange recharge. It's the way to go. I haven't. I take these giant horse pills called like wellness formula. That are, uh, yeah, they, they really taste um, like cow patties. At least I what I imagine cow patties would taste like. They're really horrendous, but they seem to do the trick. It sounds like something invented by the government. <laughs> Wellness formula by NASA. That's right. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, that's my story. So anyway, yeah, we're a little bit late this week. Yeah, but welcome to the next do? reel, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you tell people what we do here? So yeah, each week we uh, rewatch a movie that we really like, and uh, or at least something we think we like, and then we talk about it at great length. And um, uh, we do tend to spoil movies, so uh, even though we're talking about a film from 1950, um, you know, which theoretically we should be uh, have a free pass on spoilage. Still, if you don't want to be spoiled, go uh, watch the movie before we get into it, because we're going to talk about it from beginning to end, or from ed to anus, as they say. <laughs> Who is they in this case? <laughs> I think that's actually Monty Python. Ed, oh, sure. Okay. So I think right. I think I'm going to blame that one on them. Nice. Well played. <laughs> Ed to anus. I'll be working that into my vernacular. That's right. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, but people can find us over at uh, the next reel dot com, and they can also find us at facebook dot com slash the next reel. And uh, they can always uh, shoot us a, a friendly email. We like the friendly ones; those are the ones that are uh, are good. But you know, we're always up for some uh, some debate about things. Um, but yeah, we can. Uh, they can shoot us an email at show at the next reel dot com, and they can always leave us a message at six five seven two zero one seven three three five. As uh, you like to say, it's the heart of Anaheim, and uh, we love uh, we love hearing from people, and we just might. Played on the air. So um, that's right. So that's, I think that's a long short. And then, of course, uh, Twitter over at, at the next reel. I think that's all of it. I think that is. Well done. Phew. Uh, okay. So we got some, uh, we got some trailers to talk about. We have some trailers. It's a tough, tough trailer week. You know, it does feel like February when you look through the trailers that are up for, up for view. Oh, seriously, bad news on trailers. But I, I, uh, I have one. Uh, uh, mine is. It's a little bit dated. Uh, it turns out the movie. Um, gosh, I guess it was. It was originally slated to come out in 2012, and uh, it is now coming out. It's how, hitting theaters uh, in March, but it is available for uh, download. Uh, right now, uh, as of February 1st, I think. It is called Wrong, a new film from Quentin Dupieux. Uh, and I I had not seen Rubber. Have you, had you seen Rubber, his last yeah, film? I, I hadn't. It sounded really fascinating and peculiar and one of those films that I wasn't quite sure um, if I wanted to invest the time in it because I wasn't sure if I would really enjoy it or just really hate it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, I, you know, this is, it's one of those where like, I sometimes go by the people who liked this also liked, you know, referral oh. and, and people who also, who liked this also liked, uh, the host, which was, uh, the 2006, uh, Korean horror, mm. uh, film about the, the 
Giant the monster. river river monster, yeah. which I liked a lot. But the other, uh, you know, my favorites, uh, uh, Moon, uh, was one of my big favorites, uh, and uh, uh, Broken Flowers from two thousand five. I think were both great films. And so those all all tend to show up with Rubber. I haven't seen Rubber, uh, but it's one of those that I feel like I need to see. So when I saw the trailer for uh, Wrong, I got very excited about it. It's it it looks. It's one of those where the trailer starts out kind of, you know, normal, but it gets progressively so absurd that uh, uh, I think it, it, you said it would make a great double feature with that small apartment. Uh, <laughs> exactly. They they just it, it goes to this point of just fantasticness, and uh, um, I, it, it really reminds me a, a lot of adaptation that uh, that just sort of third act of adaptation where everything falls apart. So I'm very excited about it. Stars Jack Plotnick, Eric Tudor, and Alexis Diena. Uh, and again, directed by Quentin Dupieux. Go check out the trailer. You will laugh. Uh, and and if the trailer is enough for you, so be it. That may be all it takes. <laughs> it does strike me as completely oddball in every way. And uh, I am looking forward to it, uh, to seeing it. Uh, William Fitchner as kind of the freaky burn victim with a, you know, the the rat tail. <laughs> Oh my gosh, he is so funny. <laughs> and the strange accent uh, just alone makes me... <laughs> at first when he appears, I'm like, okay, this is just looks really bad. And then I realize that it's just going down that really yeah. wacky, wacky road. I'm like, okay, it could work. Yeah. It could work. You know, he's a, he's a, such an interesting guy. I, so we, we, done, I, I don't know, have we done more than one movie with William Fitchner in it yet? Like, I think we just did Strange Days. Yeah, I don't. I think that might be the only film that we we've talked about him before. We've talked he, about him before. He's in other movies we like, but uh, he's uh, he's such an interesting kind of character actor. I we talked about Strange Days right when I was going through my um, prison break phase, uh -huh. uh, and so I I watched all four seasons of Prison Break, and uh, spoiler alert, they they get caught and then they have to escape again, uh, and then <laughs> they get caught and then escape again. And and it just happens over and over again. But uh, I felt like he was really by by the by season two, he was the only redeeming thing for the rest of the the film and or for the rest of the series. And I just really enjoy watching him work. I'm I'm uh, I was very excited to see him doing something a little bit off kilter uh, in this film. Yeah, yeah, it is it is uh, fun to see him really kind of going yeah. down the the crazy road. So truly, yeah. Speaking of Crazy Road, I think you have some fantastic picks this week. You know, I, I'm doing a, a trailer double feature this week because uh, the nature of the two films just absolutely calls for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know if I actually have any intention to see either of these films. <laughs> but <laughs> just That's the, the fact, truth, man. Sometimes the trailer's enough. Just, but the fact that they both exist just makes me happy in a in a in a way that there's you know a little tr twinge of uh, perplexity, I guess. The first one is big, big ass spider, <laughs> and the second one is spiders. Three <laughs> D, three D. That's right. They're both about giant spiders. Well, big ass spiders really just about one big ass spider. Directed by Mike Mendez, who in the trailer, he actually introduces the trailer and he tells you that he's going to kill you. Uh, he'll hunt you down and kill you if you download it for free <laughs> beforehand. So very friendly guy. <laughs> uh, and, uh, this film is going to be, be debuting in March at the South by Southwest Film Festival. But the trailer is online. You can check it out. Um, it does uh, feature, uh, what's his name? Greg Grunberg from... Uh, uh, I know him from Heroes, but he's he's been in other TV shows as well and uh, other films like Star Trek, the most recent one, yes, and indeed. Hollow Man, the poor guy. And uh, I think he's currently in uh, Vegas and uh, the client list. So, you know, he's he's definitely keeping himself busy. And I don't know if being in Big Ass Spider is really the right step for him. But hey, you know what? I'm sure he had fun making it. <laughs> According to the director, they had a lot of fun making it. So much yes. fun that it's worth your life. That's right. <laughs> and then then we jump to Spiders, which actually I think just um, maybe debuted in a few theaters this weekend. And then uh, let me look at the release dates for that one. Yeah, it opened uh, this weekend limited. So I don't know exactly how wide Spiders 3D is playing. It's not here in Phoenix, but it equally looks 
um, silly. This one's about a Russian Soviet space station that crashes into a New York City subway tunnel. And then these poisonous spiders um, mutate from, I guess, whatever it was involved in what they had been doing in space. And they turn into giant spiders tearing apart New York City. Uh, equally looks ridiculous, although this one has a lot more spiders that like lay eggs inside you and all sorts of awful stuff. Directed by Tibor, I don't know, Tibor Takax. I'm not quite sure who Tibor is, but uh, um, he... Uh, Looks like an interesting guy who's done. Actually, he did The Gate back in 1987. One of my favorite scares as a uh, young teenager. Oh, excellent. Yeah, it was. Uh, I'm sure I don't want to revisit it because I'm sure it's horrible, but I <laughs> <laughs> enjoyed it as a kid. He's done a lot of TV movies, such as Mansquito. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> yes, goodness. Mansquito, the... Uh, the a scientist, uh, yeah, that one just looks pretty bad. Um, so he's really into those sorts of probably straight to sci fi channel sorts of movies Mansquito, Ice Spiders, Mega Snakes, Meteor Storm, Tornado Warning, Rats, all of that good stuff. So wow. that's, uh, yeah, and now Spiders 3D apparently they felt was good enough to give it a limited theatrical release. So if you're so inclined, go check it out. I'm sure it will be a 3D uh, spider fest, and you can just uh, really get into it. <coughs> Has there really been anything in the spider subgenre since arachnophobia? You know, the only thing that really has jumped out <laughs> was uh, uh, Eight-Legged Freaks 2002 with uh, David Arquette. Uh, which they, uh, you know, shot here in Phoenix, and it was a, a pretty terrible movie. Um, although it had some had a good score, as I recall. But um, other than that, uh, you know, you know, giant spiders. I tell you. See that that was the thing about about arachnophobia, though, is that it it wasn't about giant spiders. Well, there I was guess one there was just, one bigger spider. It was just naturally big, though. Right. It wasn't unnaturally big, like spiders. 3D where they are mutants and are literally like the size of buildings. Yeah. Not those kinds of spiders. That was it, Arachnophobia was was a great spider movie because it was just scary uh, because it was just about normal spiders, size spiders that were yeah. everywhere. Right. In all the places that you really are usually scared spiders are going to be. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, arachnophobia worked well for for um, for like, those scares. Like I've never put my slipper on the same way. Like I always sort of step on it first, you know, <laughs> right? Or or I just put my foot in so fast, so fast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good luck, it. spider. <laughs> Catch this spider. Yeah, that doesn't work when they're the size of buildings. No, it does not work when they when their leg goes through your chest or when they're yeah. catching quarters that you roll at them. Right, exactly. That doesn't work. Yeah, so. spider. So, you know what's interesting though, as a you know, oddly enough, a tie to <laughs> our our movie tonight. Uh, speaking of big insects, there was a uh, a fantastic giant ant movie from uh, what year was it? It was uh, in the age. It was 1954. It was in the age of you know the nuclear scares and all that sort of stuff. Them came out in 1954, and all these. Ants mutate and become giant man-eating monsters that uh, start plaguing the land. And the fantastic James Whitmore was the police sergeant in that film fighting off these giant ants. Wow. Yes, good old James Whitmore, who uh, is in the movie we're going to talk about tonight. How's that for a segue? Well done. That's right. Very well done, sir. <laughs> good old James Whitmore. That's right. He appeared in 1950's The Asphalt Jungle, directed by none other than John Huston, who we're talking about. Oh, okay. So I guess that's it. We're doing it. We're, you know, we're jumping in. I the figured we've talked enough about spiders. <laughs> right. This is uh, we're doing it. The city under the city. The city under the, the city. The asphalt jungle. It's actually one word. The asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not the fault. <laughs> I did not mean to inject so much <laughs> drama in my reading. <laughs> uh, oh my, 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 right. my! Yes. Uh, so this is uh, this is going to wrap up our our uh, the the current set of uh, John Huston. Oh, we have one one more next week. Like I said, we have one more next week. <laughs> oh, we do. It's our Valentine's movie. That's right. I'd already forgotten that. This is going to wrap up this week's edition of 
<laughs> our uh, our John Houston series. Uh, uh, I've been having so much fun doing this this series, and and um, I feel like after seeing this movie, I may be I, I may have been too kind by comparison to all the others. Oh, really? This I I I watched this movie twice over the last week mm -hmm. uh, because the first time I kept falling asleep because I was <laughs> so drugged up, right? Uh, and so I I only got little pieces of it. Uh, but I watched it again last night, and oh my goodness, this is a great movie. It really is. I had forgotten how good this movie was. <laughs> and, you know, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, I think, is still my favorite of all of John Huston's films. But this one quickly jumped up to number two, and it's just under The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. I mean, this is an amazing, amazing heist film. It really is. And it, it's not even just as a heist film or as a noir film. Uh, you know, or as a, um, just in general, a caper film. Um, it is a, it's a tight film. Uh, I, I'm watching this film and I'm thinking to myself, gosh, what in here is, super, is superfluous? What in here just, you could cut for time? What is in, in here that does not directly add to, um, you know, the story of each of these characters? And I mean, every one of the characters I think is, is, um, you know, taught and well used, utilized in terms of the story, in terms of the uh, the overall kind of dramatic arc, and you get to see how each each one of them is is resolved out of the picture uh, in a way that is immensely satisfying. Truly, uh, truly. In, in reading up on it, you know, you get a lot of these sort of uh, contemporary reviews that that. I think diminish it as a uh, kind of uh, by the numbers crime caper, and and I think that that really does minimize what the film did in 1950, uh, which was really to exemplify, um, you know, how to make an incredibly, um, you know, well produced crime thriller. Yeah, it's it's a great example of taking a genre film. You know, this is very much kind of a crime film, the heist caper sort of film with very noir undertones, uh, but making sure that you develop all of the characters in a way where you get full, rounded characters in the film, and you get a sense that, that they cared more about the story uh, and, and making sure that we really connected than just putting a, uh, a heist on screen. Yeah. And, and getting to know these characters in, and their little ins and outs and uh, just all the stuff that makes them tick and their relationships, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And you really get a sense of every one of them, like you said, and watching the story as it goes from, you know, the initial uh, meeting of the group and everything to the heist to seeing what happens after the heist and how each of them, like you said, each of their stories resolves. I mean, it really, you really get connected to them and it really kind of, in a way, kind of breaks your heart that things don't work out for them. Oh, deeply. Um, and, and that is, I think, you know, we, we talked about sort of one of the quintessential components of film noir and, and, uh, you know, what I think this film does so well is present everybody bad, right? There, there isn't really a good guy in this, in this film, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, everybody is, is really executing against their darker natures. And, and you are left with this, uh, this wonderful journey of kind of determining who you, uh, who you find affinity with. Um, and, and I think that makes it, um, that makes it so much more fun. Uh, do you, you know, do you find yourself on this journey with Doc, uh, Reidenschreiter, the, the German, uh, ex-con who comes up with the who, who brings the plan uh, for the heist uh, or you know who is the the mastermind or you know are you following uh dicks handley the hoodlum or the the hooligan um you know who's who um you know really is doesn't doesn't have much else going for him and so he just takes these jobs um you know I, who who is your who's your sort of soulmate through the journey of this film um, it, you know, I think it's, it changes depending on, on the viewing. Um, uh, mine, for example, is always Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I'd follow it's... her. I'd follow her anywhere. <laughs> she is gorgeous in this film. And this was a, you know, it was a breakout year for her with between uh, granted very small roles, but in this and all about Eve, both films, uh, you know, 
as small as the roles were, she definitely stood out. And she had been in some other films beforehand, again, very small roles. But this year was the year that she seemed to kind of break out. And from here forward, she became known as, you know, the big Marilyn Monroe uh, right. that everybody knows. But yeah, this was kind of uh, the big year for her. So uh, it was a good, it was uh, definitely a good find for uh, John Huston to uh, have her in this film as Angela. And she just, I mean, from the minute you see her on screen curled up in that, in that kind of a, uh, almost just wonderful little position that yeah. she's kind of bunched up in, um, you know, through the end of the film. It's just, she's fantastic and, you know, great to see on screen. And you can see why everybody fell in love with her. Well, yeah. And even her, you know, I mean, as, as innocent and beautiful as she is, um, she is, uh, you know, uh, also kind of the live in girlfriend of, you know, uh, of of one of the uh, malcontents in this film, yeah. Emmerich, and, right, the lawyer, right, and and so uh, you know it that no one I think is above reproach in this movie except maybe the lawyer's wife, the bedridden uh, wife. I don't know. I guess now that I say that out loud, she may be the the one foil for our attention of good versus evil. Yeah, um, yeah, she might, and it, it, you know it's interesting because then the film. Uh, also pairs all of that with the police co commissioner and and that side where we see these like gung ho cops who are out to kind of uh, you know rid the crime from yeah. the streets and all that sort of stuff. But what I find so fascinating about the film is you know and you get the the fantastic fantastic line about crime you know how crime is just a left handed form of human endeavor, which. I find like so, almost like the defining um, phrase of the film because right. it's almost like this is we're watching these guys. It's not like they're bad people. And that's what I find so interesting about this character study that we get of all these characters. We really get to know them. But this is just like their line of work. They're just going about their business, you know, putting it putting a job together. They're like entrepreneurs and and they're making their work happen. And I, I find that so fascinating about the way that they did put this film together. True. And yeah, and I really like that. And and watching them paired with the um uh, with the the um the police commissioner and them working to stop the crime, I found looking at it two fascinating stories of people going about their job. And I, I really enjoyed that aspect of the film. Well, and I think that's one of the things that these sort of heist movies, when they're when they're done well, they do sort of uh, either at their very best, then they're they're really executing on that level, right? Um, where we're brought into this uh, into this livelihood, not right. just story. Uh, you know, you look at at the original Ocean's Eleven and the original Italian Job in '69. Uh, you know, uh, Dog Day Afternoon uh, with uh, you know Al Pacino in 1975. Like these these films that that are looking at uh, what how crime plays so deeply into lives and livelihoods of the people who who execute them. Yeah. And I think that makes that, you know, that that's one of the things that allows us to really jump into, um, you know, jump into the the story as deeply as 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 we do in these movies. Yeah, definitely. It's um, I and I think that's the key with all of these heist films is you really um, are connected to the the people committing the crime and you know it's important when you're following people who essentially are are doing bad that you do make them likable and you find things within the characters that the audience can connect with and i think that that's what they do a masterful job with here is that we really care about these people and their relationships and we want to see them succeed and you know it, it's like i said it's heartbreaking when they don't but that's that's what makes a great heist film is when you connect to the people who are committing the crime and follow them through whether they succeed or not. I mean, Ocean's Eleven is a great example where they succeed and we're thrilled that they succeed, which is kind of, you know, putting us in the side of the bad guys. But, you know, it's because they're stealing from another a batter guy. Right. Right. But even in this case, you know, we're saddened when they don't succeed. You yep. know, when when uh, when Doc is is taken off uh you know in handcuffs or as he as his hands are are raised that they're taking his his jacket which has the jewels sewn in them mm -hmm. uh taking the jacket away 
and he's still as polite as they come, you know, making mm-hmm. good on his on his promise not to carry a gun because he doesn't ever want to risk shooting a police officer. Right. Um, he, you know, that that sort of uh, politeness in his incarceration, um, y- you know, he almost um, he, he almost is is telling us there that, you know, as part of his livelihood, um, you know, this is the cost of the livelihood uh, that he has chosen. And and. Uh, you know, he doesn't take it uh, in any way. He doesn't put up a fight. He just, it's part of the job. Yep. Uh, and I think that's a, that, that's a powerful statement that he makes. You know, it's interesting looking at John Huston's films, uh, particularly the ones that we have watched, you know, starting with, um, well, jumping even farther back to the African Queen, but then um, Maltese Falcon and uh, Treasure <laughs> of the Sierra Madre, Key Largo. You know, his films really... Uh, maybe not Key Largo, but they really seem to be about um, people who are trying to get something done and they're working so hard to get it and they fail. And uh, you also have this aspect of things, how they're fated not to work, right? Um, like the Treasure of the Sierra Madre. It just, it just you know, the the way that the the craziness that comes out in in him turns against them and uh and they end up with nothing at the end of that film the wind blows the gold back to the hills as it, right. as it ends you know and uh, in this film you know the 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 way that these these people fight and they work so hard but even doc has that line about how um you know it's just these little accidents you know the the blind accidents what can you do against blind accidents the way that the the cop's gun you know, gets knocked out of his hand, but it accidentally goes off, plugging one of the guys in the gut. Uh, just all these little accidents that keep happening. How fate steps in and is kind of working against you. And it's it's an interesting look that uh, I don't know if you could say that John Huston is planning on putting in all of his films, but it certainly does seem to play into his films. Even The African Queen, the end of that, how they essentially fail at ramming the boat into the uh, the German ship. Right. But as the German ship goes through the lake, as fate happens, the African queen, the the remains of it are kind of under the water with the torpedo and the German boat plows right into it and blows up. And so even though they failed, fate ends up lending a hand and helps them succeed. So it's it's interesting how John Huston kind of plays with that in his films. It is. The other, you know, the other thing sort of on a, on a related note is this idea of the, the dominoes, you know, the dominoes that fall. And, mm-hmm. and so you, you mentioned, you know, the, our, our uh, boxman who gets shot uh, accidentally. Um, you know, I, I kept trying to figure out for this heist that has been so well planned, what is it that, you know, what was that one, that single kind of linchpin moment that, you know, the, the pin that got pulled that caused everything to start sort of falling apart or unraveling for all of the docs, uh, you know, incredible planning. Um, well, well, it seems to, I mean, I guess it's the, when the bomb goes off, it just happenstance, it, it triggers the alarms in like every building in the surrounding area. Right, right. That's true. I, that seems to be the first accident because that sends all the cops down there. That's why the one cop comes to check to on check that on building. That, right. Yeah. And okay. so, yeah, I mean, to me, it seems like that was the thing that caused it. And and like he said, it's like there's no reason for all those alarms to have gone off. But somehow the explosion that uh, that the uh, the boxman, you know, put on the uh, the safe to blow it up just seemed to be a little too strong. And it just, uh, you know, it uh, it took him down. Right. Right. It's fascinating uh, the way uh the way it um, he he makes this this it, entire caper unravel, uh, you know, so thoroughly over the course of that remaining forty minutes, uh, it it ends up being as, uh, you know, as certainly as tight as the as the last forty. It doesn't give anything up. No, it absolutely doesn't, and that's you know, it's a great example of of throwing that twist in. In, midway through your film because the heist happens like right at the middle of the film yeah. and the twist at the end of the uh, of that part of the film that that 
switches things around in act two is essentially things starting to go awry. I mean, everything seems like it's work. I mean, their plan works so well. And I got to say, that's a, that's a, a masterfully put together sequence. You have no music. There's no score playing. You're just watching these, uh, these guys follow through with their plans to steal all the jewels from this safe. And it's meticulously planned from, from the way that they slide under the, you know, the invisible eye, and uh, and get into the safe. Everything is done so meticulously, and it's they build the suspense in that scene so well, and it's it's very enjoyable to watch. And it doesn't it doesn't feel like the the sort of nine ten minute sequence that it is. Yeah, right. Because you're really just because you're engrossed in it. It just it moves so well, right. and then everything starts going awry, and that really throws you into the second half of the film as you watch them all dealing with it. And we already know that uh, um, Louis Calhern, Louis Calhern's character, Emmerich, is plotting to betray these guys. We already know that that's in the works, but um, it really doesn't come into play until the second half. And uh, the way that that all works out, I think, is also masterful, particularly the confrontation with Emmerich and, and his detective Branham paired against Dix and Riedenschneider and how there's that confrontation with them and, and the uh, how Emmerich is playing off like he doesn't have the money and everything. And that that's another just masterful sequence with some great camera work, too. It really works well. And, uh, you know, John Huston, this this is a film is a great study of everything that John Huston does right when he's putting a film together, the way that the characters interact, the movements, the way that the shots are constructed, all the way through, it's just everything like you said right at the start. It's nothing is there that shouldn't be there. It's taught. And he put it together in such a way that you have everything you need to make this story and nothing superfluous, and it just moves and keeps you engrossed from start to finish. I think that betrayal scene is, is uh, I think you're right, it's, it's you know, one to really hang your hat on. We have uh, Emmerich and his hired gun, and, you know, the doc and his hired gun. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whose hired guns, uh, you know, whose hired guns are going to will out? Um, in, in this case, you know, I think what is... Um, I think the piece that stands out for me is Emmerich's speech um, when he is trying to lie. Uh, and it's so convincingly unconvincing uh, that, you know, you, you watch him sort of, you watch his fragility kind of, or his frailty kind of come to the surface. Uh, it, you know, oh, I, I have it. I, I mean, I have the assurance of it. I, I mean, no, I, I don't have it here in my hands, but it's promised by an unpeachable source. Gentlemen, I, I'm afraid we were uh, a little hasty. We, uh, we moved too fast. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, it's just, oh, it, it just, as he, um, as he continues to kind of unravel, he goes on. So I'm afraid a few more days are needed to raise it. I, it, it wouldn't be safe for you to carry that stuff around there. Could have come looking for the big timers like yourself. Some smart cop might even connect this burglary with your release. And then he beats, well, there you are. Mm -hmm. You know, like he's somehow made this unimpeachable case. Uh, and and in the end, it turns out that Dix was the um, was the faster uh, draw, even though he had he'd gotten uh, shot in the the quick toss of the case and mm -hmm. and the exchange of fire with the other gunman with Bannum. Uh, he he ended up uh, getting the upper hand, and and that's a, that's a great example of just the way that the camera moves in that sequence in that moment. Um, it just it, I mean, for the most part, the camera is pretty stable <laughs> stable through most of the film. It's not uh, moving a lot. I mean, it, there's definitely some movement, but it's nothing grandiose. And then that moment when they toss the case in the gunfight, the way that the, the camera just dollies as as Dix shoots and moves. I mean, it all of a sudden it's like we're, it comes to life so quickly right there. Like we're right in the middle of that fight yeah. and we're dodging bullets with him. I, that's a, a fantastic example of of Houston at work, along with his amazing cinematographer, uh, Harold Rosen, who is nominated for an Oscar for the work he did here um, and who is a, a big name in Hollywood as well. Somebody who did films like, oh, The Wizard of Oz. Maybe people have heard of that one. Uh, you know, he's a, I've, never, uh, I've never heard of that one. What's this one? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it's. Nothing worth talking Sounds about. Sounds like a prequel to Harry Potter. 
Yeah, exactly. It's a, uh, or, <laughs> or uh, tying into our other conversations, it's the Wizard of Ounces. <laughs> Oh my! Measurmental so, genius. That's right. So, in any case, in any case, it is a it's amazing example <laughs> of beautiful black and white cinematography uh, that Harold Rosen did here. Um, definitely somebody who is is worth his spit and uh, and did a lot of great things. And uh, is, he's a, actually quite a big um, cinematographer with MGM. And you know, this is an interesting little story. Um, changing course briefly, but this film is the first film that John Huston did with MGM. As we said uh, last time on uh, talking about uh, Key Largo, that was his last film he did with uh, Warner Brothers. He was tired of of the, the dealing with them, the changes that was were going through with the studio and everything, and he wanted to get out. His contract was ending, so he left. He did one film in between for Columbia, but then he came over here to MGM, did this film and another film, uh, The Red Badge of Courage, which was, uh, he had a two-picture deal. That one ended up being a box office failure, and so that ended his time with them, and then he was off doing The African Queen. But, um, yeah, so this was his first run at a film with MGM, and this film itself was quite different for the films that MGM had been doing. They were very much more the kind of the big, grandiose studio in Hollywood. They weren't known for doing kind of these these dark crime films. And so it was, it was kind of a, a change up for them. Uh, Louis B. Mayer wasn't quite so sure that this was the right direction, but Dory Sherry, who he had brought in to kind of run things, really wanted to kind of make some of these changes. And, you know, it was a smart move, I think, for, for them because it, it was a it was a great film. And um and a great step in the in the right direction for uh, for our friend John Houston. No kidding! Wow, I yeah. had no idea about that. Look at you! You're a you're you must have done some studying. I'm just a font of knowledge. Font. <laughs> the font. That's right. The font of knowledge. Somebody needs to make a font of that. Of knowledge. That's right. <laughs> Uh, let's see yes. who else stands out to you. You've got Harold Rosen. We've got uh, um, editing by uh, George Bumler. What do we know about uh, George Bumler? Anything? I don't know this well, George. Let's see, Bumler. George Bumler. Um, well, you know he uh, definitely uh, he was nominated for an Oscar for his work on Oklahoma. And uh, let's see, he did Adam's Rib, and uh, uh, it looks like he did uh, a voyage to the bottom of the sea, five weeks in a balloon. You know, he was uh, he was big in in these days. He didn't work. Uh, he worked through the fifties into the sixties, and then uh, then he was done. But uh, he was definitely around from the uh, the early thirties. So he's been around for a while. Let's see uh, who else on there. In terms well, of we <clears throat> we haven't run through the cast specifically. No, and it's you know it's a great cast. Um, Sterling Hayden was uh he played Dix Handley and a great role for him. In fact, I I don't know if if um Stanley Kubrick was uh was catching him in in uh how great he was in this heist film, but uh you know uh Sterling Hayden did an equally amazing job in the killing for Kubrick in 1956. Right. A number of years later, um just a, an absolutely fantastic heist film. And, uh, you know, Sterling Hayden, you know, it worked with Kubrick uh, um, after that as well in uh, Dr. Strangelove. And just, you know, I <laughs> just can't get enough of, uh, of him in that film. It's just one of my favorite film roles ever. He's uh, so funny talking about the uh, precious bodily fluids. Oh, and truly. Yeah. So uh, Sterling Hayden. Yeah. So he was in this. And then uh, Lewis Calhern was Emmerich. And, you know, talk about an actor who really was doing something different. Uh, Lewis Calhern, who was nominated for an Oscar, I think for best actor this very year for his role in the magnificent Yankee also appeared as, um, Oh, what's his name in, um, uh, Annie, get your gun. He appeared as, uh, oh, what's the cowboy show showman name. I'm totally blanking on his name right now. Uh, let me look. It was uh, 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 Buffalo Bill. He played Colonel Buffalo Bill Cody in Annie Get Your Gun. 
And so, you know, the, the films that he had done up to this point were not quite this sort of film. So, so being in a film like this, particularly in a role that ends in suicide, I think was a, a real change for uh, Cal Hearn. And, uh, you know, it was a fantastic role for him and certainly one that he should be remembered for. Truly. Um, James Whitmore, I already talked about him. He was fantastic. And this is Gus, the uh, the hunchback, who is uh, just wonderful in this film. And of course, um, I mentioned them, but uh, let's not forget that he was in uh, Planet of the Apes and of course, The Shawshank Redemption. Just one of the greatest films ever made. He is, um, he, he's an interesting guy. I mean, you talk about um, uh, uh, the uh, wild or the uh, bill, uh, Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill, right. You know, the, uh, uh, he was, let's see, he uh, went and did a lot on Broadway. Um, uh, Are you back uh, on Lewis Calhoun? Or? No, no, I'm on uh, James Allen Whitmore. Uh, he ended up, this is what, one of the things I thought was so interesting about, uh, about him. He ended up uh, winning the title King of the One Man Show after appearing in the solo vehicle, vehicle Will Rogers USA uh, in the 70s. Uh, but he, uh, you know, he's a Tony Award winning uh, actor in uh, the production of Command Decision in 48. Um, he just really sort of found a home uh, doing his, uh, doing his Broadway thing. Yeah, didn't yeah. know that about Whitmore. He's uh, he's uh, really knows what he's doing. He's a great actor. Fantastic. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, oh, look at this. Sam Jaffe. Um, I think was just brilliant. In fact, he was uh the one actor singled out for an Oscar nomination in the Asphalt Jungle for his performance as Reedan Schneider. He got a Best Supporting Actor nod, um, and well worth it. And I think his performance in this film. Uh, was was stellar as Reed and Schneider, um, and, and you know something we didn't mention, but you know how how creepy he is as a character with this kind of this fascination with watching young girls, right? Yeah. Um, but that's something else that we didn't um, mention is is another interesting thing this this film looks at is the vices that people have and how vices can be things that bring you down. And he even says it one way or another, we all work for our vices. And here he is, a man who's brought down because of his lust for young flesh. Exactly. The clock ticks two to three minutes earlier. He would have, uh, he would have been able to get away. Yeah, but uh, if, if not for his uh, fascination. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, again, it's heartbreaking. And, and we see how Dix is affected because of his, his need to bet on the horses. Right. And, uh, you know, um, uh, Emmerich is you know, kind of stuck on having to have lots of expensive things and, you know, his, his little, uh, hobby of having his young women on the side and everything. And, and everybody ends up getting brought down by their vices in this film. Right. Right. So, uh, a great thing, but yeah, Sam Jaffe was, uh, you know, fantastic in this film. He was in, uh, you know, the day the earth stood still the following year. He was in Ben Hur. He was in bed knobs and broomsticks. Uh, you know, he was an, a guy who was around forever. In fact, he was even in Battle Beyond the Stars. So somebody who's That's been so around, funny. somebody who's been around for a long time. And actually, his IMDb photo that uh, they have for him that comes up is um, is from the old man who cried wolf. Which I don't know if I have seen it, but that face with him with the beard and everything, that older version of him, right? Th like I totally recognize that, and it's probably from like the bed knobs and broomsticks. <laughs> era stuff like that i just totally recognize yeah, that that's face. that's the guy that that uh, that i feel like i grew up with yep exactly hey you know i i do want to say we forgot to mention with james whitmore his terrific performance in uh the shawshank redemption speaking yeah, oh, yeah. of speaking of that's the guy i remember like so when you look at his fa his his uh imdb photo or his uh you know his classic 1955 headshot uh, that's floating around Wikipedia, and then think about him in uh, Shawshank Redemption, and you see how he ages over the course of 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the guy I know. Well, and that's what I love so much about him being in this. And I, I, yeah. I, I did say uh, Shawshank Redemption earlier. I just Oh, you did? Um, I, just, I was delirious. I, you were cough, coughing. Yeah, and... sure. <laughs> 
whatever it is you're you're dying I was of over hacking there. something up. <laughs> That's right. But James Whitmore, I, I love that he in in Shawshank Redemption, he's this this prisoner who's been in all this time and he's finally getting out. And it just ties in so well with this sort of film, the asphalt jungle that we're watching, where he ends up, you know, getting put away because of everything that he was involved in. And you it's almost like Brooks is the the resolution of a character arc for yes. him, you know, of this character that That's he's playing. And exactly it's exactly right. That is yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. I just love that. It's too funny. Um, Mark Lawrence is in this as Cobby, uh, the guy who kind of uh, brings all these people together. I mean, he's one of those actors who you just recognize from all these films uh, back in the day. He was in, uh, actually, he was in Key Largo. He's one of the guys in that film. He right. was in The Man with the Golden Gun, Marathon Man. He even was in From Dusk Till Dawn. So he's somebody who's uh, who's been around for a while. Dusk Till Dawn. That's <laughs> a great movie. He, he was even in Star Trek The Next Generation. He was in a, an episode of the show there. Oh, that's too funny. Yeah. You'll have to watch. I, I need to actually go back and look at that one. Yeah, The Vengeance Factor. Volnoth. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, he was great. Um, and then, you know, we can't, we, we already talked about Marilyn Monroe, but Gene Hagen is also in this film as Doll, um, you know, Dix's girl. And if, you know, she was just an amazing, amazing actress of the time. And this is an amazing, heartbreaking performance that she gives in this film. And it's a, an Amazing to see how good she is in this film and then put in Singing in the Rain, which came out a couple years later, and watch her play Lena Lamont. And you can just see what an amazing actress she is. It's such a different character. And just the way that uh, that she brings to that totally different character to life, I think, is just is fascinating. And I just love how awful she is in Singing in the Rain. And I love how how heartbreaking she is in the asphalt jungle. Oh, heartbreaking, truly heartbreaking. And, you know, talk about like, it's so easy to pick apart, um, you know, all of the gentleman's vices, right? You know, one, one drinks, one doesn't, one watches girls, one doesn't, one, you know, they, they all have their thing. But hers is, I, I mean, she her just true desperation to, uh, you know, to take care of dicks. Mm -hmm. uh, in no matter what he throws at her, uh, yeah. it's just, it's, it is so sad to watch her kind of unfold as a part of, uh, an unwitting participant in this, um, you know, in, in the resolution of the caper and then to watch Dix end up, you know, passing out and get eaten by horses. <laughs> That's how I, that's how I interpreted the end. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Kentucky comes for him. <laughs> but it, you know, but yeah, doll. It's it's interesting because her. It's almost like her vice is her need to be saved by dicks and mm -hmm. and to be there for dicks. And it really is her. The, the most heartbreaking moment for me is is when you know he passes out in the car and she takes him to the closest doctor, which um you know she takes him to that house and she's in there and. And she says, it's my husband. And just the fact that she says it's her husband, and I'm sure it's just part of the cover and everything, but I mean, that really does define her need and, and what she's really hoping for out of all of this is that that he will take her away from all this and marry her and and everything will then be okay for her, you right, know? Right. And when she says that it's her husband, uh, you know that, Part of that is just, you know, her desire to make it true. Exactly. And that was like her one chance to do so. And it really is. It's touching. It's heartbreaking. And it's just beautiful. It is. It is beautiful. So. All right. What else you got? Uh, you know, it's based on the novel by W.R. Burnett. Have you who, read it? Uh, you know, I haven't. It's oh, one yeah. that I really want to read. I, actually, now I really want to pick up a good number of his books because so many great films have been based on his stuff. The Asphalt Jungle, High Sierra, uh, Scarface, um, even um, jump. Well, sticking in that era, Little Caesar. You know those sorts of great films that we've been talking about as we've been looking at John Huston's films. But even looking at some of the the novels that he wrote uh, later, like um, uh, what did he write? Something for the Great Escape. I want to say um, I can't remember if that if he actually wrote that or uh, I think he actually wrote the script for that. And, um, you know, stuff like that that he wrote. I mean, this is a guy who's uh, written 
amazing characters. And I, I really now find myself wanting to read some of his stuff. Absolutely. I was just adding the the link to the book to our uh, list of, of, you know, books mm-hmm. based on. And so I, I have, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, um, uh, trying to start my my collection of these those that I don't have there it's it's on the website now and it'll be in the show notes too yeah and the interesting thing about this particular story the asphalt jungle is that it was so popular in 1950 when the film was made that they went back and actually readapted it like three more times afterward uh, once was as the Badlanders a western in uh, 1958 that uh, who directed that one um, Delmer Daves directed that one. So that's a, one version of this. Then you had the, um, uh, what was the next Ky- version? Cairo. It was called Cairo. Yeah. Cairo in 1963. That was, uh, who directed Cairo? It was, uh, Wolf Rhea directed Cairo with George Sanders starring in that one. And then the last time was as kind of a black exploitation film in 1972. And that was Cool Breeze. So it's an interesting story that uh it was such a good story that it ended up getting adapted um four times essentially Uh, the best time i've only seen the first uh, but i've heard that the first one is really the the best adaptation of all of them so well uh that's uh i I think cool breeze is is gonna be second on my list have you seen that poster (laughs) it looks pretty cool that dude is serious Uh, Thalmus, Thalmus Rasulala. There you go. Stars in uh, Cool Breeze, directed by Barry Pollock. And then uh, John Huston adapted the book with Ben Matto, who uh, you know he brought in to help him with this. And Ben Matto is uh, you know another great writer who's who's done uh, the Wild One. Uh, he did some uncredited work on that, The Naked Jungle, Johnny Guitar. Uh, you know. Uh, God's Little Acre, The Unforgiven. And uh, he actually, um, I think he took part in adapting or doing the TV series that came out in in the 60s for The Asphalt Jungle. The TV series? Yeah. No, yeah they, it, it, again, it was so popular that they actually uh, made a TV series out of it. Wow. Uh, I got to check uh, Netflix. Yeah, I'd be curious to see if it actually is out. Um, who was it who was in it? Um, somebody, I want to say it's, uh, boy, they don't give a lot of cast. Jack Warden, that's who was in it. The Asphalt oh. Jungle, no. It is not. And, so apparently, and apparently Jack Warden, who was in the show The Asphalt Jungle, had a bit role in the 50s, in the film in, that we just watched. And I don't recall seeing Jack Warden, um, but he was you know, one of the one of the cops. Was he? Okay. I, that's my that's my understanding. I couldn't. I I didn't pick him out. All the cops look like you know square jawed. You know. Yeah. Soldiers, exactly. So right. Uh, fascinating. Yeah, I can't find it. That's going to be one I want to track down. Yeah, definitely worth something. Uh, be something that uh, would be worth checking out. Yeah. So. Uh, so, uh, let's see, where do we, uh, where do we stand on this film? Should we be ranking it at this point? Are you ready to rank? I think I, I'm ready to rank. I, I think we, we hit all of our points. So fantastic film, definitely worth, uh, worth checking out and watching time and time again. Time and time again. Uh, well, it. this is the one, you know, I, this is, this is yet another one of those films that, um, you know, they, they, they say they are stereotypes because of films like these. Yeah, and truly, this film did really uh, start the trend of of caper films. Yeah, yeah, it really so, did, and it's and there, I mean, so many films owe so much to uh, so much to this film throughout the sixties and seventies, um, and even you know, I I uh, you know, even at the Usual Suspects, nineteen ninety five, uh, you know, I, they just keep coming. Yeah. Definitely. Even the Ocean's Eleven films, the the recent ones, even you could even even say Inception. I mean, yeah. all of these films take you know great uh, stock in what the Asphalt Jungle did in creating this whole subgenre of the crime uh, genre, creating the, these caper films and the heist films. Uh, you know, I, I tend to think that heist films probably is it might be more accurate because caper films, I think, has has. I think initially they were probably all caper films, but I think over time the 
term caper has turned into more of kind of one right. that has more comedy elements to it. Right. Um, you know, gag, I think, like gag films yeah. kind of thing. And like the, well, even like Ocean's Eleven, I think that's just much more of a fun heist film. This one is just so much more of a serious heist film. I Calling it a caper film, yes, it probably still fits, but I think the way that the term has changed, I would just more call this a heist film. Yeah. Either way, yeah. either way. And then we have films like, uh, you know, what, what was it? The Inside Man. Mm-hmm. Uh, just these, uh, yeah, it's uh, the the darker, grittier interpretation. Absolutely. All right, let's rank it. All right. Now we did add all of our, all of the films that we've been talking about on the film board, so we've added a few extra films to our list. But uh, so let's start here. We've got the Asphalt Jungle or the Dark Knight Rises. Why does that have to come up first? I'm totally all over the Asphalt Jungle. Yeah, me too. All right. Uh, Asphalt Jungle or Zero Dark Thirty? Mm. I don't know, man. I'm I'm uh, I'd lean towards Zero Dark Thirty on this one. That's true. I I think Zero Dark Thirty is is an absolutely stellar film. I I will watch the Asphalt Jungle more, but well, Zero I don't Dark... know yet. I don't know yet. Well, yeah, that's true. Zero Dark Thirty was a masterpiece, so we'll do Zero Dark Thirty. All right, the Asphalt Jungle or the Descent? I'd probably uh, Asphalt Jungle. Yeah, I agree. Asphalt Jungle or Fight Club? Fight Club. Yeah. Uh, Asphalt Jungle or Up in the Air? Asphalt Jungle. I'm torn on that one. I Up in the Air, I think, is just uh, another stellar example of amazing characters and uh, watching these people um, as their story progresses. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go Asphalt Jungle with you on that one, though. The Asphalt Jungle, uh, well, back to Fight Club. We already picked Fight Club, so uh, so there we go. And all right, number 24 out of 72. I like that. feels good to me. And when you, uh, when you look at that, that puts Asphalt Jungle um, at about 67% on our list. I feel like all it right. would probably be a, a little higher. But again, we got some some rework to do on our yeah. list at some point. Yeah, no, that yeah, that feels good for right now. That's, yeah. I'm, I'm liking that. Now, where do we go for next week? We have got our Valentine's Day. Uh, event. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna definitely take a big jump forward in John Huston's uh, uh, chronology. We're skipping quite a few films because we wanted to do one that was a little more uh, fun for Valentine's Day, and so we're jumping all the way to 1985, and we're gonna talk about Pritzi's Honor. Man, that's a big jump. It is a big jump. Wow. Yeah, we're, we're skipping quite a few of his films. <laughs> but really, it was just because we felt the Valentine's tie-in would be kind of fun. <laughs> That's right. And frankly, it's been so long since I've seen that movie. Uh, yeah, I've seen these movies that we've we've just talked about. You know, I've seen those, uh, frankly, a lot more recently. I think the last time I saw Pritzi's Honor was in the theater in 1980. 85 wow 85 yeah. I, I saw it i know i saw it uh i didn't see it when it came out i don't think i saw it until college um but still i mean that puts me a good 20 years since i've seen it so yeah. i'm definitely looking forward to watching it again yeah so we'll see how well that holds up yeah yeah i got nothing else i gotta go start coughing um <laughs> okay, terribly man. right now so uh well, thanks just, for a good talk man yeah just don't die and uh, that way we can make sure just we have a good, good chat don't <laughs> die <laughs> just don't <laughs> die you know that should be a greeting card a get well card with a flower just don't die just on on black it's just like a carnation and it just says just don't die that's horrible I, I would hate you if you sent me that card i'm gonna send it to you i'm gonna hate you for it <laughs> good night andy <laughs> good night pete We wanted to take a moment to thank you for your continued support over the years. It's hard to believe that we've been having weekly in-depth discussions about movies since 2011. That's right, 12 years and counting. Producing this show is a labor of love for us, but it does require a lot of time and effort each week. If you enjoy our podcast and would love to help keep it going, there are some easy ways you can show your support. One is by using our Originals page to shop for the original source material that movies we've discussed were based on. That's right. In season one alone, we covered 13 films adapted from books or plays, from Charlie Kaufman's adaptation to David Fincher adaptations like Fight Club. 
In season two, we covered even more, like Powell and Pressburger's The Red Shoes and The African Queen from our series about legendary cinematographer Jack Cardiff. We can't forget about the four Jason Bourne movies we talked about. Love those movies. Well, the original trilogy, at least. <laughs> for our Richard D. Zanuck series, we did Jaws, Rush, Big Fish, and more. And for our horror series, we talked about John Carpenter's The Thing, which was adapted from Who Goes There? We did our first great car chase series with movies like Bullet, The French Connection, and Drive. And for the holidays, we did Preston Sturgis's Christmas in July. We had a great John Huston series with adaptations like The Maltese Falcon and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And for our baseball series, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Have I told you lately how much I love that movie? Uh, yeah, I think you have. Plus, our Magician series and Heist film series had adaptations as well tons of page-to-screen gems. Listeners can find the details and links to the original material at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, or movie you buy through our links helps support the show, and it's no extra cost to you. So dive in and get your next read today. Thenextreel.com slash originals has all the films adapted from other sources that not only we have covered, but all of the shows on the Next Real family of podcasts. Check it out and get reading. Support the show and build your reading list. It's a win-win. Head to thenextreel.com slash originals.